Hi, and welcome back to another edition of Inside the Ville. My name is Greg Norman, your host. We will be exploring uh, mural art in downtown Ortonville today. We have uh, Kevin Burdick, who just completed a huge mural on, uh, on one of the walls in downtown Ortonville that was commissioned by the village of Ortonville. And we're going to talk to Kevin a little bit about the art. We're going to talk to uh, Melanie Nyvelt, who spent some time kind of putting the whole program together and, and how it kind of fit with the village and coming out of the pandemic and how it uh, meets the uh, sort of marketing needs of the uh, Downtown Development Authority. We're also going to talk to Matt Jenkins. Matt's the Downtown Development Authority Executive Director, and uh, Ella Menino spent some time with him. And I think you'll find that to be this a really interesting show. Uh, I learned a lot about what I would not call graffiti art anymore, but certainly mural art. It is a, uh, uh, it's an amazing piece of uh, work, and I think you're going to find out that Kevin is a very talented artist. So stay tuned, and we'll be back in a second. We're talking with Kevin uh, Burdick, who is a graphic artist who just completed a mural in uh, downtown Ortonville. And I, I, I say, first of all, thank you for having a, a conversation with us. And I use graphic yeah, no artist as a very loose term. You are a graffiti artist is the only thing I can really think of in terms of a term. So maybe you can explain exactly what it is that, that you should do. That you do. Yeah, we try to steer clear of the word graffiti artist just because usually the graffiti has like the negative uh, connection, you know, right. but uh, to vandalism. And we try to say street artist, mural artist. Um, it's pretty broad, but I mean, I do canvas stuff, uh, you know, fine art. The, you know, classical, but whatever. <laughs> but as we're going to get into this discussion, you're going to find out that it's it it really is is an is an art form in its own sense. Even the tools aren't just walking down to a hardware store and buying a can of paint and going. Yeah, it's a very sophisticated development of of an art that is you know world renowned and and you do it wonderfully. And I guess to start with, um, you did a mural in Ortonville in the last couple of weeks. Yep. We can talk a little bit about that specific project, and then we can talk a little bit about you. Cool. Um, yeah, the first, uh, the project in Ortonville, I think they contacted me, I think it was last fall. So we were able to do some good planning over the winter. It wasn't too rushed, which is the best way to, you know, make sure both sides of the um, project are happy. Me, as an artist, you know, you know, I produce my best stuff when I have a little bit of freedom, you know. I don't like the rains too tight right and then um you know and then they end up getting a better quality you know more bang for your buck and uh i think through the winter we had a couple meetings you know we did a few sketches they approved it and then uh you know moved forward and then we were just waiting you know obviously with the uh, COVID 19 stuff that put a little damper on the thing but only about a month delay and the weather ended up being perfect the week we I ended up doing it um was awesome i think it was a week of the 18th Started on a Monday, um, or no, Tuesday. Monday rained, and then Tuesday, and had her wrapped up on Friday. Essentially, and, and you'll see pictures of you doing the, the actual work that we have taken earlier, so you'll see what the, mall, what the mural looks like. More and more municipalities are dressing up buildings, especially ones that may, may look less than sightly. They're, they're dressing a lot of things up with the kind of art that you do. This particular uh, mural is, uh, has the old hotel in it, has a yep. carriage. Uh, welcome back to, uh, not welcome back to Ortonville. It says. Uh, yep, you're right. Yep, welcome back to Ortonville. Welcome. It was going to say welcome to Ortonville, but I think they they came up with the welcome back because, I don't know, it just goes with the old timey feel of the, you know, you're looking back at a scene from the old days, you know. When you got, when you started talking about the, the conceptual part of this, mm -hmm. well, did you come up with the ideas or how, I mean, Kind of walk us through that whole idea. What the, what the mall originally looks like? Um, originally, it was they had talked about how it was a big logging town, Ortonville. It was really based in logging, you know, and then the trains. And I wanted to do the old classic, um, the scene where there was the horse with the big stacks of logs on the top. I always think of that Michigan old timing logging, you know, when the horses were pulling these giant sleighs with huge logs. And I wanted to do something with that. That evolved into a carriage, and then the old timey feel. They then they came up with the hotel, and then they just put those two together. And well, it's hard to believe, but there was a railroad track that ran from downtown Detroit right up to all the way up to uh, Ortonville. I mean, it's just it's 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 a pretty amazing 
it, it's funny, if you look at the history, even with our own area, transportation was obviously king. We had an unbelievably, we had an unbelievable um, transportation system. And then the you know, automobiles, automobile dealers, guys, I'm going to cut all this stuff out. So turn over. Okay. Cool. No, we just, just to cut part. My brother-in-law that. kept calling. Well, ex-brother-in-law, he's grabbing scaffolding out of my That's fine. garage and keeps calling. <laughs> okay. So we'll, we'll, cut this, we'll cut this little part yeah. out. Pick it, back up. it took you, how long did it take you to put, to actually put together the, the mural? About three, four days? Yep. Um, Tuesday. Yeah. And actually I didn't end up going down there Friday. So it was, it was three days. Now a lot of your art is done in a variety of ways, but a lot of your art is municipal versus um, sort of private, private practitioner. What, what's the percentage in, at this point? Um, I'd say a good 20% or so. Um, I think I've built up a little bit of a, I don't know, history with some of the, you know, these smaller towns, the GDAs around here, and they kind of talk and network through their, you know, I don't know what that is, the businesses or conferences or something. And I guess my name gets mentioned here and there, maybe Facebook, but uh, it's. Uh, I find it. I find it interesting. Good. I find it interesting that governments now pay you for what used to be illegal. Exactly. So it, it tells you everything you need to know about the evolving art. Does it not? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, and it's well. I wouldn't say so much that the art is illegal, but the form of how I'm doing it, you know, with the aerosol was, you know, if it was spray paint, it wasn't art, which I think is a, you know, art can be anything. But yeah, now I'm doing it with spray paint and it's uh, yeah, getting paid, you know, government funded. <laughs> so before we get into the specifics about the art, you were a Heartland kid that ended up graduating from Powers, uh, 2003, yep. am I mistaken? Yep, 2003. And then I think you went on to the... Uh, uh, University of Pittsburgh Art School. Yep, yep. Art Institute of Pittsburgh. It was so the art, first art school in the whole country, actually. Art is something that you've done. You know, like it's a, it's a lifelong profession for you. Oh yeah, embedded. I mean, I was drawn on every placemat at a restaurant when I could hold a pen and pencil, and uh, probably did a little too much drawing than homework most of school. My notebooks were filled with more drawings than notes. Were you a good student? But I was lucky. Uh, lucky I was able to turn it into something that I can, you know, do forever. Was mom and dad artists at all? Um, in a way, my dad kind of engineer type stuff. I mean, he draws all his own projects, houses, and stuff. My uh, grandpa was an architect, and my great aunt was the major art influence. She was a um, fine artist. Uh, studied at Michigan State, and then she had big time shows. She has stuff at the Detroit Institute of Arts at one point. And she was a great support, you know, convincing my parents that it was something that I could do. So as you're, as you're studying art and you're going through this whole thing, how do you end up doing the, the, the kind of art and the kind of murals you're doing now? It's, there's got to be a term. Um, there's got to be an influence somewhere. I, yeah, I, I mean, it's probably the, just the culture of street art and where it came from, how it did originate with graffiti and people doing it and not getting paid. And, you know, they were the hardcore you know, people who paved the way for us. And then it's evolved into um, not just letter form graffiti, but, um, you know, full murals, basically, you know, uh, with scenes, uh, you know, a little bit more connection to the classical style of landscapes and stuff. And that's evolved into what I do. And I was, I was actually painting motorcycles for the first five or six years out of uh, high school airbrushing cars and bikes that was a huge industry in the early 2000s you know and uh it's just kind of tapered off and the mural stuff's taken off right now i can think of the orange county chopper as the old program and yeah. some of the artwork some of the artwork that was done on you know gas tanks and those kinds of things that i mean there's there's some truly incredible art if you yeah if you remember watching that program. that was another kind of form of cool art that came out of the 70s you know that was not accepted in museums but I mean, there's no arguing. It's amazing art, you know? Well, you might make an argument that Kilroy, the old uh, World War II little Kilroy was here. Oh, yeah. It was painted all over Europe and then eventually came back to the country. There's some suggestions that that may have been the first sort of street art that really was, you know, had gained popularity. Yep, it really was. And there's, I mean, there's great documentaries about that and stuff. And I mean, he created a, 
a cult following almost that I know that, I mean, a lot of people, other soldiers were tagging Kilroy just as a, you know, it almost became their crew was like, um, just about putting that name in the hardest spots, you know, way behind enemy lines. And I mean, that's, that's kind of a bit of what the graffiti culture is, is, you know, putting your name up around. And I mean, obviously I don't condone the, uh, a legal aspect of it, but you know, to the people that are hard into it, that is dear to their heart, you know? Well, and I think you have to consider that, you know, graffiti art or in this case, mural art, uh, street mm -hmm. art is a, is a mainstream art form. It's not, it, it's, it's, it's not hooliganism and juveniles running around with paint cans. I mean, there are kids yep. that do dumb things on the sides of buildings, but they've been doing that for, for 200 sure. years. It's nothing new. Yours is yep. a respected form of art that again, take a look at, what you do with a spray can. And I think it's pretty evident that you better have some talent. It's not just, you know, throwing it up, throwing paint up on a wall. Cause I think that's yeah, exactly. important. kind of explain a little bit. I think of, you know, well, it's a spray can and you just have a really good hand, but as you were pointing out to me that the, the various kinds of equipment, maybe kind of walk us through just how specific the equipment is that you can do kind of art that you do. Yeah. I've got, um, special cans there's quite a few companies now around the world that are uh, providing lower pressure spray paint cans interchangeable caps different shapes you know for getting different effects um it's still spray paint you still got to have like really quick hand movements and right. stop and you know get your finger control but uh, the stuff i use it's uh, acrylic it has better uv protectant in it for the sun you know to fight the color fading um the caps are the biggest thing just, I mean, there's caps that spray a foot wide circle, and then there's caps that go down to about a half inch. Like um, a like a fine artist would have different color paint brushes, different sizes. Exactly, different brushes. I mean, the color um, they have, I think, over 200 colors you can pick from. Amazing uh, variety. If I bought a, an average can, a three dollar spray can, what's it cost? To, but what kind of what could it cost for your spray paint? Uh, the good stuff that I use is ranges from about seven bucks up to about twelve dollars so for expensive. the highest end stuff more expensive. it's low pressure it atomizes which means it mists really good for perfect color fades um so lower it's strictly, pressure it's strictly designed for that yeah it's act. made for street art yep street art specific yeah okay. i work with a company called cobra they're out of italy and i was hooked up with them through another art a group really famous um group of artists nomad clan from england and they hooked us up and i'm able to work with this company and i've been specifically using cobra paint for the last uh probably a year now how long has the industry sort of evolved from a technological standpoint Are, is, is this relatively new in terms of its um uh, yeah i think it case? was maybe 10 years ago the first company came out started making specific mural cans a little bit thicker paint uh, lower pressure can so the paint doesn't drip as much a little more opaque so it really covers good but i mean you do pay for it so it's about you know double the price of a normal can what's the best application for you is it large size when i say large size are there walls too big are there size of buildings too big and then the follow-up question is what's the best is it cement block? Is it brick? Or does the, does the, the actual surface matter to you? Uh, when it comes to size, I love, I mean, big, but it's rare you find, you know, a building owner who's going to let you do something so huge and actually have the budget for it. Cause it's a lot of money. You know, you lifts, giant scissor lifts are involved and the logistics get a little tough, but I love it. I just got to do a huge uh, 70 foot wall in downtown Flint. And that was just a dream come true for me. Um, when it comes to, uh, uh, what was it, the other stuff? Oh, the bricks. Um, a lot of cities have ordinances where you can't paint over red original brick, which I think is great. That keeps, you know, the cities. But if they have been painted, most cinder block walls are painted. Um, if it's been previously painted, I'm allowed to go in and do murals. The city, you know, you, there's not a lot of fighting with the cities on those. Um, my favorite is probably the cinder block that's been pre-painted, maybe even four or five times, where it's got a nice smooth surface. Anything that doesn't absorb the paint. Original brick is like sponge, and it really soaks it up. What's your largest painting? 
The largest painting is probably that one in Flint. I think it was about 45 or 50 feet wide by 70 feet tall. It's just, uh, it's a one large crane. It's on my business card. And I think I gave you, okay. um, it was on the back of the Ferris wheel mm -hmm. up in Flint. It's oh up. yeah. It's not showing up with the Can't show background. The Put it in yet. front of you. It'll work. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's um, good. There you go. Yeah. There you go. Oh, upside down. Do it the right there way. There you go. Yeah. It's a big sandhill crane. That's, uh, you know, kind of doing its dance with the water behind cool. it. I is the there's a large whale in downtown Detroit. Is that a mural? Is that yep. a, that's Whalen, yeah, that's painted. That's a guy, he's uh originally out of Troy area, Detroit. He's kind of one of the godfathers in the mural business. He's worldwide, big time. I mean, he's out in LA now, I think. But I'm guessing that's gotta be a couple hundred feet tall. Oh yeah, that one I bet you is a hundred. Well, maybe more, yeah. It's probably fifteen stories, hundred and fifty or so. Yeah. I don't nice. know the exact but yeah, that's a good one. And everybody gets to see it. It's one of the greatest locations because we're next to Comerica. I'm not asking how much you get paid for the, the mural because it's none of my business, but I'm, I'm curious is the, is the value, is, is the amount of money, how do I ask the question? The amount of money one can make as an artist is it like every other art, there's starving artists and then there's those few that make lots and there's others that just sort of scramble at it. Um, I think there's a, I'm, I'm kind of in that, in between where, you know, I'm not living pay to che paycheck to paycheck. And I do like telling kids that. I know it's not, you know, you don't discuss that. But if, you, if you're really determined and you provide a, you know, high-end product, people will pay for it. And that goes for anything. But uh, make sure, you know, your customer's happy and they spread the word and you get paid and you'll eventually have uh, some money to sit on. I, I don't know how to say it other ways, but no, I, I think it, there's urban. good, there's good money in it. If you can break through into that top percentage of, you know, artists that are, you know, you can, know. I guess the point is you can make a living at it. You can. Oh yeah, definitely. Uh, people are, I think are a lot more, you don't have to sell art in just a gallery. That's what everybody thought back in the day. You know, it was the only way to make money selling paintings in a gallery. And there's other ways of doing it. Now I'm assuming the painting behind you is an original. Oh yeah, I got one back here. Yeah, big kind of 3D. Yep, that's spray paint and some airbrush. That's some of my abstract. Do you do besides doing buildings? Do you do obviously you do regular art with the same yep. medium? Yeah, I do portraits and stuff. It's tougher to um, you know, to really do a quality painting. It takes a lot of hours, almost as much as you know a mural. And people think of a painting like they don't want to spend more than a couple hundred bucks. So it's tougher to find those clients that uh, will pay for your time, right? But they're out there. Do traditional galleries give you the same respect as they would a, a watercolorist or a, a, an oilist, oil art or person who wears the oils? In a way, yeah, I think so because it's, it's different and new. I think there's less people doing what I do. So they get kind of excited to see a thing. And I, let, I really try to do some canvas work at home, maybe during the winter when the season isn't as good for outside. Um, and use those paintings, these really wild paintings of animals and whatnot as my murals for the next season. Um, so my fun murals, there's most of the stuff I do is uh, commercial. So I have to, you know, do what the customer says, but sometimes I'm lucky and I get somebody that comes in and they're like, Hey, here's our budget. You do what you do. And we'll, you know, go along with it. I guess my last question is what's the, what's the most, uh, I don't want to say the most fun, but what's the most satisfying for you in, in what you do? Probably, probably like kind of what I was just saying, where I get to create something completely out of my head, where I'm satisfying myself. I'm, I always try to push it. You know, every mural I want to be better than the last one. Really pushing myself to be like, you know, my top heroes that I watch. And um, I don't know. It just clicks. That's another thing. It's hard to explain. But when you do one that just flows and it's balanced and, I don't know. And sometimes when you're doing stuff for the cities and everything, you get away from that really wild freedom, that awesome freedom. So my favorite is definitely when I get to go wild. Actually, I wanted, I need to mention that the, I'm a big, I don't know, supporter of the Flint Art Project. It's called Flint Public Art Project. And they bring in artists from all over the country. And we're doing, last year we did 100 murals all over Flint, some massive, some small. and. Uh, those ones, we're allowed to do whatever we want. The business, 
the grant is paying for the artists and the funding and the paint, but then the building owners just provide the wall. It's complete freedom of the artist. So honestly, they get their best, the artist's best work. It's complete artist freedom. So that's, that's my favorite stuff. You'd rather do something then from your head than, than, than sort of be confined to a, to sort of limitations on what the uh... yeah and i'll take references still from photos online you know but i like mashing it all up and some crazy weird thing like i'm really into animals and birds they're my favorite things to paint i love painting feathers for some reason i don't know getting that soft look um with spray paint is a challenge right so i like that yeah i also notice when people watch you work because they're not used to seeing the medium and the way it works it's different than watching other artists that I've watched and, and noticed. It does. Yeah, it's pretty entertaining. Because yeah. you can see it. It's such a large form that it's easy to right. see, even from standing back a ways. You know, when somebody's painting with a paintbrush, it's so tiny. Unless there's a camera right on it, you can't see it. So it is entertaining. Uh, I, don't, I don't, again, your explanation of just showing me the paint cans and some of those things, I, I'm not sure that everybody really understands that it's as evolved as it is. Mm -hmm. the culture. You know, I go get a you know can of paint and I find a railroad car and away I go and it's yeah. a lot it's a lot more than that and I think that's the point that I was trying to make oh yeah definitely there's an awesome culture the street art world is getting so big some of the highest paid artists right now that are living are um, street artists or originally street artists and a lot of them are graffiti artists you know doing it illegal who have gone you know kind of grow up have kids got to go legit uh, you know and for real. put some uh, food on the table and they just hit it oh, huge some of the biggest ones obey uh, this guy shepherd fairly the fairy um i love it this world is opening up for sure well the mural that did in ortonville is is spectacular we really appreciate you doing it and i really appreciate you spending some time kind of explaining it oh yeah no problem it was fun so thanks again for your time and uh we will uh we'll look forward to more art from you Cool, definitely. Have Thanks. a good one. That was Kevin Burdick from Fenton. He actually went to Powers High School, who is uh, becoming uh, a very legendary mural artist. Uh, up next, we're going to talk a little bit with uh, Melanie Nivelt and have her flesh out the story uh, about just how the DDDA got involved and how the village of Ortonville got involved in putting together this, uh, this great piece of artwork in downtown. We're talking with Melanie Nivelt, who is a member of the Village of Ortonville Planning Commission and also a volunteer for the Downtown Development Authority. We were t we've been talking quite a bit about the mural painted by uh, Kevin Burdick, which is really cool. And you were kind of the catalyst in getting him and, and getting that uh, the wall painted. And maybe just kind of take us, I, I guess I just want to put the sort of the village's um, connection to it because we've interviewed him and we've interviewed Matt Jenkins, who is the DDA director. So maybe you can flesh that out for us. Okay, well, um, so you want to really know how I found Kevin? Yeah, and, and, and what, was the, what, was, what was the thought of how, how you got there? Okay, um, I started, not that I was stalking or anything, but I started watching Kevin, Kevin's work in Holly about two to three years ago. And that's where I first became familiar with his work. I had not met him, but I knew his work very well. Then I saw it again um, in Fenton and in Berkeley and in Clarkston. And I thought, well, this guy, he's brilliant at what he does, but he's going someplace. He's immensely um, talented. He really is. Yeah, he's, he is one of the best I've seen. Um, and I've been in advertising for 30 years. So I've been around wonderful creative people. And this guy, this guy has it. Um, and what we used to call tagging, he's now, it's a career. He's a muralist. Right. So it's very cool. So um, when we were doing the master plan, we um, were asked, what would you like to see happen in downtown? One of the things that I wanted to see happen was a mural. Um, at the same time, when DDA was meeting, and I, I was not meeting with them, they, um, Courtney McLaren and, and Matt Jenkins, they wanted to do murals. So lo and behold, here we are parallel. and um, they called me and said, hey, would you be interested in spearheading this? I said, absolutely. Are you kidding? This is like a dream come true. And I said, and I know exactly who we need to get. So I copied all their, um, all of Kevin's information and supplied it to the um, DDA, talked with the owners of the building, 
which was the most important thing, because if we didn't have a building and owners that were game, um, this so, yeah, could never go. Matter. Yeah, so um, huge thank you to Jason and Jeremy Kraft. Thank you, thank you. Um, so we literally started in January, had one meeting. From there, we um, did everything via computer. And we were, we were ready to go with the mural in April, but because of COVID, um, we had to wait. So we just finished it in May, which was cool because it was historical preservation month. So it kind of, you know, worked well in that regard. Um, but we are very lucky to have gotten Kevin um, to make time to do this for us. Um, in a couple of years, he's gonna be he's gonna be national, and we can always say, "Hey, that wall was painted by Kevin Murdoch." And I told him I made sure that he signed it for us too, because it's very one of a kind. I don't want to sound tacky, and I'm not going to ask him specifically, but is it hundreds of dollars or is it thousands of dollars? And if you don't want to answer, I get it. Yeah, no, um, I, all I will say is it was divided. Um, the DDA got a, a grant from, what, uh, who did they get? Flagstar. They okay. got a, a Flagstar grant, and then the owners also put in some money. They split That's the cool. cost. That's cool. Which, you know, right? Yeah. And especially during this time when... You know the craps. They're, you know, at businesses shut down. Blah blah blah. But they're still like, no, let's do this. And we wanted it to be something when, you know, when people can start walking and get out of their homes again, something that made people smile and happy and be able to walk to. And the idea of the at first we had welcome back to our welcome to Ortonville, um, but Matt Jenkins thought, you know what? Why don't we do welcome back to Ortonville? which I thought was brilliant on both levels. You know, it's back in the history and back out, you know, coming out, out, out of your home. So it worked out really well. In interviewing him, I was really surprised. You know, we think of graffiti and we think of, you know, kids with paint cans. Tagging. What was, yeah. what was, really, what was really spectacular about interviewing him is just realizing that he has the tools as a professional muralist. Mm -hmm. Any other professional watercolor might have with brushes all the different kind of cane, paint can tops and all of the other kinds of, now he's painting in some cases, as he pointed out, a 70 foot wall. So you have to have a pretty good eye for the canvas other than maybe one sitting in front of you. But the tools, right. the tools of the trade have really, you know, uh, been upgraded and, and even low pressure. I didn't realize there was low pressure spray paint. Mm -hmm. So you can, you can do different kinds of things. So it's, it's, it, was, it was pretty cool just learning about the art itself. Mm -hmm. and, and, the, and the fact that, that that paint will stay for a good yeah. 15 years before it needs touching up. Yeah. And it's not going to be totally, I mean, that's lovely. But yeah, he went to um, the Art Institute of Pittsburgh. Yeah. So yeah, he's just a very good artist. And it's in his family. I know his aunt was a professional artist and, and whatnot. So um, yeah, it just all worked out so well that he had time in the schedule and wanted to do it. Um, and if you drive through Holly, which many of us do, you know, all those murals down there, that's him. The other thing I was going to point out is if you stand back a ways and look at it, you get a perspective. But if you look closer to it, there's more detail than you think. Oh, yeah. Faces on the people. Shades. Um, and and yep. it really is really good art. Yeah. And, and the yeah. fact that he can hide the highlights, if, if anyone paints or knows a little bit about lighting for photography, he is highlighting with spray paint. Yeah. I find that amazing. <laughs> no, it's, so, yeah. it's really good. Yeah. Well, listen, I appreciate you fleshing out the uh, the rest of the story. Hopefully, uh, we'll get this up on the air here pretty quick. And uh, I appreciate your yes. time. Yes, and I'm, I'm just looking forward to hearing what people think. And I just want to put out a big thank you, please, to um, thank you for you doing this. But for Matt uh, Jenkins, our director of DDA, and Courtney McLaren, the president of DDA, for going after funds and wanting to do this. Um, the owners, Jeremy, Jason Kratt, thank you for giving us a canvas and saying, let's do it. And then also um, Kathy um, Egbo, I believe. I have not met her yet and I can't wait. She was our historian on the project. Um, Carol Egbo, she was the historian that I contacted for info and Kenny Bush um, from the Old Mill. Okay. So thank you to all of them how cool it is to have all these entities come together and work together and have fun. So it is possible, Ortonville. <laughs>
Yeah. And I hope to do more. I really do. Thanks so much for your time. Thank you, Greg. That was Melanie Nivelt. Uh, Melanie got a chance to explain to us a little bit about um, the process and we want to move forward. Uh, Ella Menino we had a chance to talk to uh, DDA Director Matt Jenkins. That'll come up in a second. And also pay attention, we have the uh, coming back to Ortonville's promotional video, which is on just after the uh, interview with uh, Ella. And we hope you uh, enjoyed so far. We'll be back in a second. Um, how about, uh, do you want to tell us a little bit about the mural and why you guys had it commissioned? It's been uh, public art, a public art initiative has been on the uh, DDA's plan for uh, the last few years uh, and it has just not risen on the priority level uh, uh, to be something that uh, we were able to accomplish. And <clears throat> We started talking about it in January and assembled a, a small task force of volunteers to look into it. And then when the pandemic hit and we were forced into the stay home, stay safe order, it just seemed like a perfect opportunity to try and follow through uh, on the idea and um you know it's th there's a lot of different moving parts and a lot of things just kind of came together that uh, really allowed us to um, um to pull the trigger if you will on on this mural project the i will say one important thing is May, the month of May is National Historic Preservation oh, Month. Wow. And uh, historic preservation is one of the key components of the National Main Street Center's purpose. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it really is uh, the component that uh, takes our little traditional hometown and ensures that it remains an authentic place. Yeah. Now, the Ortonville DDA is a nationally accredited Main Street community. And so we're very familiar with the goals and objectives of the National Main Street Center. Yeah. Uh, and this is, this is our way of celebrating Historic Preservation Month uh, this year. Awesome. Um, so what, what is the mural, you know, <laughs> what's in it? Uh, can you tell us about that? <laughs> we have, we have kept it under wraps. Oh, really? Okay. Yes. So we're a little secretive thing here. All right. But the, the, what we can say is the goal of the program, not just this one mural, but subsequent murals. Oh, there will be uh, more is to highlight uh, historical references to the village of Hortonville. Right. And so you will see when this one's completed, multiple references to the history of Hortonville. Uh, and the task force uh, consulted with a couple different uh, local historians uh, on uh, the components and we have we have a running list of historical references that we want to include oh. in our public art and so this one will have uh, a couple awesome I look forward to seeing the completed project um, so you mentioned some more murals um, can you give me any details about those you know okay. You know, re with limited resources, uh, we will take it slow. And really, the the magic in this program is the the collaboration, a, a true public private partnership. Uh, and so, on our task force for this current mural, were the 
to property owners where the mural is going to be located. And so really that's key is yeah. for us to work in harmony with the building owners. Uh, and when they get excited about the project, things really fall into place. Now this mural, uh, we did receive a grant for, and that is how we were able to uh, pull the trigger um, this spring. And so we will be looking for additional financial resources in order to proceed with future projects. All right, awesome. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the artist? Uh, Kevin Burdick, uh, really uh, task force representative Melanie Nivelt, she was the one to connect with Kevin. She had uh, been made aware of him. He's done several murals uh, in other communities regionally. Uh, and so we were actually able to see some of his work uh, live, you know, yeah. on, on buildings. Uh, and he participated in a couple of our brainstorming meetings. Okay. Uh, we essentially provided him with the feedback. We had community feedback, feedback from the public about what what they like uh, in downtown Ortonville, what they'd like to see in downtown Ortonville. Oh, wow. okay. uh, so we shared that feedback with them and the feedback from the two uh, historians, and we let him create it. Okay, awesome. Uh, and there was some some suggestions between renderings, mm -hmm. uh, and, but it was really. He, the artist taking the feedback and coming up with the mural. Yeah. Right, so it's very like reflective of the community and things like that. Exactly. Okay. Awesome. Um, yeah. Are there any other, well, okay, I have a question. Um, so I've noticed downtown an old blacksmith shop. Is that your doing, the DDA? That was undertaken by the Ortonville Community Historical Society. Okay. They, they it's uh, similar to the mural project. It had been on their wish list for quite some time. Okay. And um, they were able to raise the funds uh, to do that blacksmith shop. Uh, I'm not up to date on exactly where it is. They were, prior to uh, the pandemic, they were um, trying to uh, have it uh, available for our springtime garden show, which was supposed to be on May 16th. Uh, they weren't sure if that was they were going to be able to meet that uh, timeline, but certainly it's something they want to finish and have open to the public when the museum is open on Saturdays throughout the season. Yeah, for sure, very interesting. Thank you for telling us about that. Um, one last question. Uh, how do you think COVID is gonna affect um, some of the many events that our community enjoys, such as Peak Fest, um, Beats, Beats and Eats, September Fest? Do you have any idea on that? The, it's a topic of conversation right now. Uh, we just, uh, earlier this week, uh, canceled our June 18th food truck rally. Uh, it would have been the third year in a row for uh, the launch of that event during the season. And, you know, we keep looking at the subsequent events through the season. Uh, one of the things that we've, we've realized or we believe is <clears throat> the reopening of stores downtown is going to be uh, a signal and it's going to be a way for us to gauge uh, best practices and public willingness to come downtown. So essentially what I'm saying is as uh, the community gets more and more comfortable to return to the stores. Yeah. That will give us a pathway 
to bring people downtown for events. Yeah, for sure. so, so it could be a while. It could take us a while to get there. Uh, but another example of a way to um, uh, encourage or build confidence in the community is our farmer's market, yeah. which uh, is deemed an essential business. And our market manager has spent, and a small committee of volunteers have spent the last few months uh, following the Michigan Farmers Market Association recommendations on how to best and safely uh, function as a farmer's market. And so we will be putting those practices in place Saturday, uh, 9 a.m. to 2, starting in July. Okay, awesome. So those are some of the things that are happening that uh, will, you know, really give us some solid uh, understanding of how and when we can have events again in downtown. Awesome. Well, it's really nice to hear that you guys are taking into consideration all of the safety measures and everything. I'm really excited to see when events open up, and I'm sure the rest of the community is excited to see the mural, everything. Sounds like you guys are doing great things, but I'll let you go now because I'm sure you have more important things to do. Thank you so much for spending time talking about these things with me. Oh, absolutely. Thanks for the opportunity. Mm -hmm. Of course. Stop recording. Our world has changed, but our community has never been stronger. In this crisis, we turn to what's most important, our family, our friends, our neighbors, our community. And that fills us with hope, compassion, purpose, resolve. While we remain apart, we are connected in a new way, our love for Ortonville. connects us and makes us stronger. It's the reason we live here, work here, volunteer, serve, and teach here. Brighter days are ahead for us when doors will reopen, streets will fill, and activities will resume. We will shop, dine, stroll, gather, and celebrate together again. Until then, love Ortonville. commercial that uh, was put together by the DDA for uh, promotional work for downtown and uh, Ella talking a little bit about Matt about the uh, the wonderful artwork we've been talking about for the last 45 minutes with uh, Kevin Burdick and Melanie Nybelt. I want to thank all of them for coming on today and uh, stay tuned for next week. We'll bring another edition of Inside the Villa and for all the folks in back. Uh, thanks for joining us. Mm -hmm.